Uh, last week, uh, you heard from Nat Owings, and um, as Nat often says, I'm, I'm the youngest partner in Skidmore today, and of course he's the oldest. And uh, in fact, Nat founded the firm before I was born, so it gives some idea of following each other in this order, and I guess that's what Walter Nitsch had in mind. Um, I'll talk a little bit about management and business uh, of Skidmore and Merrill, but I think, first of all, you have to realize that I'm an architect first. And I, and, I, and I consider myself an architect and not necessarily a businessman. Um, to go on a little bit about Skidmore, and, and, and there's different ideas about Skidmore, and I'll probably be talking about them as I go on, because uh, most of the speeches I've ever given have never talked about Skidmore. I've always talked about the basic theory of financial management, and I guess tomorrow afternoon I'll get more into that and also into land development and the different cost structures and things like that involved. But for tonight, we'll stick with Skidmore and Merrill. But I just have a story to say, uh, uh, and, and it bewilders me of Skidmore and Merrill Times, because as you know, we're just finishing up now the Sears Tower, which is four and a half million square feet, and a few other things. And just about four months ago, uh, we decided to add three new offices to our space at 30 West Monroe, and this, the three offices were designed and built, put in, and they moved the furniture in, they found out they didn't have any electrical outlets. And so it, it, it baffles my imagination how we can do a big building, and I've never seen a job yet done for internal purposes that has ever worked. It's surprising in some of the uh, uh, of things that we've gotten into, and you'll see some of the drawings later on of some of the remodeling we're doing in Inland Steel, uh, is that it would probably be cheaper to hire an outside architect, but usually the, the fees or the labor we incur in designing the space uh, uh, exceeds the construction cost. And if we were, we have to be our world's worst client to ourselves. So with that in mind, you have to understand a little bit about what business and architecture is. And I'll read a little excerpt, from, um, and, and this dates back some time, and I'll do it later. But it says that, and it's a magazine article, that the profession of architecture might be represented by a dual face figure, the attention of one face directed towards art and that the other towards business. Neither the art nor the business sign may be neglected in the successful pursuit of an architect's calling. He must cultivate the artistic temperament of the artist, but no less the common sense methods of the businessman. Now, people think that the business and architecture is just a recent innovation, but that came from an article appearing in the Inland Architect on April 1st, 1908. And so for the last 70 years, it seems that architects have talked about business and architecture, and it's surprising to me in the last 10 years a lot has been talked about, and you know, and I'm called out to do a lot of talking, and, it, and surprising uh, that all the talking is done by the schools. Uh, very little of it is practiced by the practitioner, thank God, because we followed most of the business techniques that are so-called that he should follow. He gets into more trouble without it. I think one of the most interesting things that I have found in doing different consulting work among architects is uh, that the architect left by himself will usually come out and land on his feet. It's when he calls in the different consultants, and it can be accountants or lawyers, that he runs into trouble because they fail to understand what really the architectural practice is. Uh, a recent Harvard Business School study asked the question in a survey of architectural firms in the country, is good business management and good design essentially contradictory? There are a lot of answers to that. But I think that, as I answered it, that management, if it's expressed in terms of being the subtle art of motivating people to achieve a common goal, then it can be consistent with good design. Otherwise, it will not be consistent. The difference between architecture and business is night and day, or heaven and hell. And I won't refer to which one's heaven and which one's hell. But the differences are enormous. And I think that they're only enormous when you go through six years of architectural training and then you immediately go into two years of business. The differences crop up in terms of how you go about a problem and also how you tend to view a problem after it's done. For those reasons, I think that to go on and talk about management of SOM or the business side of SOM, I like to go into four different areas of what I call as management components. And they start off with the leadership style, the organization, the monitoring systems, and the motivation. And what I mean by these management components, I guess, is this is one way to explain business or one way to explain how does all this fit into the architectural practice. If you look at the first one, leadership style is probably the key to, the, to any kind of organiza organization of architecture. 
a leadership style of different partners or different principals within a firm is enormous. Uh, you can go in SOM in Chicago and see two different management styles almost immediately. You go to each office of SOM and you see different ones. SOM is not organized as one firm, even though we talk about it as one firm. It's a series of projects and it's a series of people working together towards, we hope, a common end. Uh, you cannot compare New York versus Chicago or Chicago to San Francisco, primarily because of the leadership styles of the partners within that office. To equate Gordon Bunshaft in New York to a Walter Netsch in Chicago would be absurd, and to have the same organization for each would be just completely contrary to what the basic principles of architecture are founded on. Uh, so when I talk about leadership style, I really want to talk about how the man relates to his people, how he relates to the client, and how he relates to himself in performing that job. Um, leadership style can, you know, the easiest way to approach it is to say on one side that the guy is a Democrat, on the other side the guy is a Republican for when he is political. Analogies. In the firm, it's very much like that. You have one partner who will be very interested and works very, very closely with these people. On the other extreme, you can have a partner who likes to delegate and has a, has a so-called areas of responsibility, and he just watches the surface and watches for key elements. The two do exist within the firm, and it's the management framework that's got to go together to service both. When you go to the organization then, th this is where it comes out, and this is why we'll go in a bit later with the organization and what's going on in Chicago right now, but also what the organization approach is taking throughout the entire firm, and the, and the great urge or the necessity now of looking for other branches, uh, uh, going into other branch offices, the concept of moving the firm not in terms of growth in personnel, but in growth of the quality of people within the firm. The monitoring systems is basically your accounting reports, the cost control reports. One of the questions was asked earlier is, SOM evaluate the offices. You know, do they compare Chicago versus New York? Well, you know, you'd always do that, but I think the basic system, the basic control tool is the project. Uh, every office has several projects, and those projects are evaluated on their own regardless of whether they're in one office or not, or in, or in another office. The issue always comes up, too, is that, well, how can you compare different projects when they're being done by different people? And again, you do that by looking back towards a leadership style and looking at the type of organization that that particular partner has established for himself. SOM has, the, has a, a connotation of being a large office where people are shuttled between uh, divisions and departments and that they're on one floor and then they move to another floor and no one knows anything about them. In essence, uh, uh, SOM is just a series of very small offices and I think later on when we go through the Chicago uh, reorganization you see where it's even more clearly defined. Uh, it's not uncommon for a man who comes into the firm after six months or eight months to be second in charge of a job. It's not uncommon for a guy being there one year to assume responsibility for a job. Uh, it's, it's surprising for a guy like myself to be where I am because I still am amazed by him. I think that uh, when I first applied for a job with Skidmore and I was in business school, I decided to fly over to, sh to Chicago at my own expense and being a student like you and like we all were at that time, we didn't have two pennies to rub together. So I got to Chicago and got in a taxi and went to the offices and walked in and talked to the associate partner. And I told him that I was in business and architecture and that I was very interested in getting a job uh, in terms of the business aspects of the firm. And at that, he pulled out a bunch of computer sheets and he said, we have all the business management we need. They're all in the computer sheets. We don't need anything more. Uh, at that, we went down to the street level and we went out to lunch and he paid for his lunch and I paid for mine. I got back in the taxi and went back to Boston. Uh, a year later, I came back through on a, on a trip that I, uh, I took out to the West Coast and stopped in and saw the same associate partner again, and I said, I think that I could be of some help, but could I get a job? And the same approach was, we don't need business and architecture. We have enough of it. It wasn't until I had accepted a job on the West Coast with a land developer, and about eight months later, that I got a telegram from the Chicago office asking me to come back for three months because they had some trouble with some networking they were trying to do. Uh, based on that assumption and hope, uh, we moved the family back to Chicago, and three months turned into uh, a few more years. But I think that the recognition of business or basic management concepts uh, is only now beginning to be felt in architecture, and I think it's going to be quite some time before they're really fully understood. And, and all too often, the architect and the student coming out of school starts his business in two years or three years, 
and all he really has to understand are some of the basic pr principles and also how to keep a checkbook. Uh, when you get larger, uh, you tend to need more expertise, but uh, just like when a client comes to you and selects you as an architect, you have to do the same thing when you get a lawyer or an accountant. Uh, it, it's, it's so easy to pick an, uh, a lawyer you've known for a while or an accountant you've known for a while, but it, it, you, the same kind of criteria that a client uses for you, you have to use for your own consultants. So with that little digression, I like to keep going on this. The fourth item is one of motivation, and I think in the last few years, you've seen the, uh, you probably know some of the labor uh, unrest that's been occurring among arch architectural firms, and I think it's only now being felt at what is the motivation of a firm. And the motivation ties very strongly into leadership style. A person who's very close to his, to his group, uh, who was out on the drafting boards with him, has the, has the, the staff to his house for dinner, goes things like this, that's one type of reward. The other type of reward, of course, is monetary, you know, and, and everybody right now would like to have more money. But I think it's a proven fact, and I would hope that most architects would realize it, that money is not the answer and will never be an answer to a man re realizing his own self-fulfillment within the architectural profession. You can keep paying money, but there'll be more money in year after year, and that isn't the reason an architect's an architect, even though every architect ought to make a living and ought to make money. Uh, that alone is not going to be a sufficient uh, emphasis for him to remain with a firm or even to be on his own. With now going over the leadership style and the organization of monitoring systems and motivation, I'd like to go back in the history and talk a little bit about the leadership style of SOM because that's really what the purpose of this uh, talk is about. And if you look back at SOM's partnership, founded in, in 36, and, and, and what I've labeled off here are major areas in which the Articles of Partnership, because SOM is a partnership, but it's not a corporate entity. And these are the major times in the firm's history where there have been major changes and significant changes in the partnership documents. And from 36 to 48, when the firm was first growing up, it was kind of the growth pattern of the firm, and a lot of things did not occur because of the war, but it was still kind of an entrepreneurship. In 1948, with the advent of, of, of men like Bunshaft, Severinghaus, Cutler, Brown, Hartman, the partnership took another turn. And from 48 to 59, and during this time was, was Walter Nitsch, Dave Hughes, and, and, uh, and uh, John Merrill Jr., is that during the 48 to 59 period, you saw a, a, a period of extremely rapid growth in almost every type of architecture or planning available. You also saw a very strong emphasis towards design and departmental organization. If you, if you go back to those times and you look at the cost reports they used, the kind of things, everything was very departmentalized. There was architectural department, a mechanical department, electrical department. Everybody was a department kind of. There were specifications, estimating the rest. It was very departmentally or organized. During the 48 to 59, you saw a great deal much more of transfer of knowledge. Between the, between the partners as well as between the offices and between the projects within that office. The project was not the king yet. The, the, the growth of departments, which was kind of the first process of any growth of architectural firm, the growth of the disciplines and the growth of these departments had much more meaning. The hiring of people, uh, uh, everything else had much more significance because the people who were heading the departments actually were hiring. And so you saw between 48 and 59 probably uh, some of the best people being, uh, being uh, hired by the firm, but also being retained by the firm during this time. That's why, because it was such a tremendous effort, and the Articles of Partnership pointed out even more, there was not any talk between 20, 48 and 59 of a single project. Sure, you know, there was the Air Force Academy, there was Oak Ridge, a few other things that were starting either before or after this time, but those jobs themselves were organized on a departmental basis. They weren't organized on a job basis. One of the things that suffered here was almost uh, was that the, the departments were very well organized, but that the, that the project itself suffered, the client relationship, the idea that the project is really what you're doing. And one of the things that started growing during the 48 to 59 period was the concept that we're in business because of our clients. The, the idea that most architectural firms, when they enter this kind of period of time, and one of the, uh, the, the fallouts of a departmental concept is that people tend then to look at themselves, you know, what can we do? Uh, one of the advantages that happened to the firm during, during this time, there was almost no discussion of what are we doing and looking at themselves internally. It was a question of what are we going to be doing and pushing much more 
for, uh, for more work, but also for more people within that. Uh, most architecture firms, when they get to this, uh, this area, tend to look at themselves and how can we be better organized. And there's a, there's a, there's a fallacy in that because unless you're, you're out projecting and getting the work and, and getting the client and pleasing the client, then everything else is secondary. I think if architecture has changed anything in the last five years, I would hope that at least it, all architects feel more, more uh, 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 friendly, you might say, or at least more aware that the client is the one that's hiring them, but also they're working for the client. Uh, I get very upset with uh, uh, architects, and they're all my age, I guess, who, who talk about the four-day week or talk about the three-and-a-half-day week or about five or eight weeks of vacation a year, is that that's fine. But the client who is paying you is not on those hours. And if a client calls and, and you happen to be on your vacation, uh, I think it's a disaster. You're a service. And, and, uh, and as such, you have to be related to that client. Now, that, you know, as, as I look at it, if we're moving in the service industry, um, you know, I, I can't see why architectural firms can't be open 24 hours a day. Uh, I think that you're there to service. And that's one of the things that started to creep up now between 48 and 59. Now, what happened in 59 was that there was a more taking of new partners. At this time, it was Bruce Graham, uh, um, Chuck Bassett, and uh, Roy Allen in New York. And, and the, there was a start now, again, uh, of, a, of a new partnership article, a new partnership agreement. And this article, where they saw the weaknesses of the departmental system, you might say, of more emphasis internally, more emphasis on departments. You saw creating in 1959, and it's flourishing now, the so-called project team concept, where everything was completely organized around the projects, where a job like Hancock or a job like Carlton Center, all those jobs were based on a project team and engineers, architects, and everybody, got, everybody was pulled into one unit, and that project began to move. Uh, this had two things. It tended to, to institutionalize uh, the, the organization, you might say, of the firm. And, and, and also it was, in, in many respects, as you look back at that time, I don't think it was the case, as you look back towards the leadership styles, it hampered uh, some of the basic philosophical beliefs that some of the partners had towards the practice of architecture. Some partners do not want to have more than two or three jobs, and they want their own people, and they want to be actively involved in them. And a project team's concept, this did help, but the project team's concept also meant that if you didn't have enough work for your project team, the project team had to go. Um, also, between the 59 and 70 period, it was really the age of the 60s, uh, you saw come into, into being uh, almost a, a, a total reliance on the project. If you had the same project team on two jobs, at least you got the same flow of information. If you didn't see it on two jobs, then that information and the amount of experience they picked up on that job was lost because there was no, no way of communicating knowledge, building specs or estimating the rest on a project team. It was carried by the people. Um, also, you, you tended to find the people being hired and fired here were by the project teams. And there was a, a very little concern in some of the real movements, and I think some of the history looking back on it, there's been a moving away from the project teams and also a moving away about how can it be better? What's, uh, you know, how, where are we really going? Uh, I think that this probably finally occurred to everybody in 63 and 64, and it's taken a long time to evolve into what is happening right now in, in the 72s with the idea of the new partners being elected. And also with the, uh, uh, the average age is different. If you've noticed is that the people that were first brought in in 1948 are retiring now. And in 59, of course, they're coming to be. In 72, we're still the younger ones. And I used to refer to the uh, the partners in 59 is the older partners, and I've been corrected many times at calling them the more mature partners, so there's no disagreement. But I think that what, what you're seeing is that everybody is learning from experience. You learn from experience just by being aware of some of the problems. I think some of the, the personnel problems we've had in San Francisco and New York have been very good. Uh, uh, I was very instrumental in those, and I, I thought they at least became an aware it's, and, and that's really all architecture is, and it's all business is, and architecture is awareness of the problem. So anyhow, in 1972, with the new Articles of Partnership, you're seeing be created probably what I like to refer to as a staff line group, and that's kind of a business way of approaching it. But for the first time, we're still going to have projects teams, but project teams would be organized around a studio concept, which means that <coughs> excuse me, within the studio, you might have four, 
five projects, but the studio will relate to staff. In other words, there'll be staff functions uh, um, in terms of estimating specs, things that can transfer that knowledge from studio to studio. The studios, because they have more than one project, should be able to fluctuate and, and, and hold their people, as well as transfer people, hopefully, from studio to studio. Um, this, I can go through in Chicago. I think that the whole concept of a studio, and the studio ended up being a funny term because the most important concept here is the line versus staff, the idea that there are certain people doing their jobs, and those people have to be interested in short-term uh, items, just like profits on a job. You saw in the 59 to 72 period a great emphasis on profits uh, because that's a short-term goal. Now you're seeing the long-term goals influenced, I would hope, with the influence of a staff group where people in architecture, engineering, uh, are more concerned about what are the long-term goals, what are the goals that we want to accomplish in the next 15 to 20 years. It's interesting, for instance, to see the average age of Skidmore and Merrill right now being 31 years old. I think if you, if you went back uh, to the 1962-63, the average age, even discounting the fact that people were still there, the average age was around 40. Uh, one of the other things that's surprising is back in 1962, we have three levels of, of partnership. We have the participating associate, the associate partner, and the general partner. And back in those days, we had one, uh, uh, one person in the partnership group out of 6.5 uh, of the staff. Right now, that's now one out of every 3.2. And it would be my hope, and I, I honestly hope a hope, hope that by 1975 or 78, that one out of every two people will be in the partnership group, and that people will come to Skidmore um, to to join the firm and not to be hired by it. I, I, uh, I think that's that's a very basic philosophical stand that the firm is taking now that we want the best possible people, but also it's up to firms like Skidmore to lead the architectural profession in terms of how should they treat their people, but also what's expected. Um, so, I'd like to, to, to show some slides once about some of the studio staff line concept and how the firm is organizing itself. As I said, you could go through the whole offices. And, you know, in Chicago, I would say you see a very strong emphasis on the 72 now because that's where a lot of the work is being done. All the partners that you'll hear from in, the, in these lectures are all tied into one office. And, and my only uh, unique role is that I'm kind of tied into all of them because uh, I'm involved with the internal administration of all the offices. And, I, and I, it'd be stupid of me to tell you right now that all the offices are where we, you know, what we're contemplating for 1972. I think it'll be 1980 before we're even close or near halfway near it. And also the offices do are different. You can't make one general pattern and say this is how the offices are doing, primarily because of the leadership style of the partners within that office. As the partners change, you'll see a new type of organization start. Uh, can I go on? I'd like to go on to some slides. I'll do these very quickly, then I'll come back to some external considerations for SOM. Do I just push this now? Can't see that game. Well, that's a slide of the world. And it shows the great amount of work that's been done by SOM, both overseas and, 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 and in the United States. Uh, recently, uh, we've just opened up the Paris office and uh, I would hope that it's full-blown right now. We're moving in some furniture and a few other things. It's in Paris. We also have a small office in Boston, and we're going to move with a small office in L.A. I think that when we talk about offices, though, we want to talk about the studios, that we have studios that are serviced by line functions. One of the problems the firm has always had is that people think that SWM you know, is a huge body. But I'll tell you, there's nothing centralized. Everything is as loose as, as it can be. And in talking with some people from Continental Bank the other day about international operations, uh, I'm convinced that we're as loose as they are. Um, but we're hoping that this staff group that we're mentioning does tie in tighter and is more centralized control, but that the studio and the projects themselves will be kept as fluid as possible. The next slide kind of shows what the typical, we've shown this chart, I guess, uh, maybe for 12 years. And it's kind of representative of the period of 59 to 70, of the strong emphasis on the projects. And, and, I, and I can't overemphasize that enough. Uh, the entire offices and all offices, uh, even though some came in later than 59 and others are still there, all offices have gone to this project team concept. Uh, you can see here where the project is, the, you know, is, the, is, is it for everything, but everything revolves around the project. There's very little mention of how do you get feedback into the project, how, how do you get uh, 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 
some kind of human involvement or human understanding of human involvement within the project. Everything is project oriented. Then, one of the things we did, and this whole thing we're talking about now, starting in '72, uh, was started about two years ago by writing a little report on what line and staff could be. And one of these items, you can barely read it, I know, is a kind of a definition of the staff functions. What are we really talking about? You can see here the research and development, the estimating, the construction operation. About. You can see here the research and development, the estimating, the construction operations, the environmental engineering, structural building systems, architectural building systems, graphics, interiors, areas which are definitely staff functions and should be there to service the project, but of themselves are, are, are staff entities and should look for the right people and develop their own. I think that if you look at the future of the firm and the future of SOM, it's how well this is developed in the next 10 years will be how well SOM is in the next 20 years. The long-range future of the firm lies exactly in this area. It does not lie in the ability of the firm to produce a better and faster job. It already can do that. It can't do this because no firm is doing this. Uh, it, has to, it has to structure itself and get the proper people. I think that this kind of system in a staff group requires better people than we ever uh, ever could imagine even five years ago. The next slide goes in, into why we ended up showing studios. And studios is a funny word because that's been used and it's kind of an architectural nomenclature. But this is a typical office plan. And it shows a little bit of how you get off the elevators and winter the core. Is that on one side what we've done is, if I can move away. <laughs> And also that we've been able to respond much quicker to different problems that the client has uh, uh, or anything else. Now the staff groups that we talk about are on a floor by themselves and they're organized like studios too, except the entire staff reports to uh, a partner who is Dick Linke who will be here talking about how we're doing estimating specs on the rest. Now this is just a very simple diagram of these studios where we have one, two, three, four, those are all individual studios, and then this technical staff service, showing how it feeds in and being the line versus staff. The line function, of course, are the studios. The staff function being the services of estimating specs computer. This is the other side of the coin where we go into project administration being a staff service and also the office administration. Again, there are staff services supporting the project. Now, this is kind of a combined one of the whole thing, showing all of the 14 studios plus the technical staff, project managers, and administrative staff. Now, that's all the slides. Now, um, oh, hold on. Uh, I'll go to this one. There's one more. About this. I want to show what, what the monitor will go into some accounting tomorrow, but I think one of the things is that all during this time and, and all the projects coming out, the reporting system have all been done by projects. And what we're doing now is that this report still comes out by uh, every two weeks, but it gives you some idea of when a guy works for a studio head, uh, the studio head receives the information of who's charging which jobs and, what's in, and how are they doing. There's also another report which goes through what the profit is per job in his studio. It used to be by project. Now we're lumping the projects into the studios so that the so that studio head is responsible 
for the for the technical as well as an overseer of the, of the financial. The project manager, however, is still the ultimate authority and the guy who has to follow the money part of the whole job. Then we have these budget reports, and it's important for a studio ahead to meet these budgets. And this is broken down by Architect McKenning on structural. This is still a carryover all the way back from 48. So, you know, we haven't eliminated all the disciplines in terms of this. This is carried through. Uh, really for the last 20 years. But again, the studio head established the budget or the people working under him, and then they use this as a monitoring tool on how, how they're doing or how things are going to go. That's all the slides. Now, um, one of the things to talk about is we also have come up with a very uh, uh, unique system, we believe, of how to evaluate people within the studio. It, you know, the studio head now has maybe 25 people reporting to him. And due to that, we've made up a series of charts where we have not discriminated between administrative or secretaries and, and technical people. Everybody's in one, one ball of wax, but there's a reporting form, a review sheet, where the studio head and the man he's reviewing sits down and talks about. It's important we've found out, and it's something like every, every firm looks at it and everybody wants to know themselves, is, you know, how am I doing and where am I going to go? I think the instruction we've done to this employment uh, little thing that both the, 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 the guy does along with the studio head comes up with some very interesting phenomena. There's a lot of reasons that people act in different ways, but also it's a firm belief that a guy given enough area of responsibility, if he's good, will thrive dramatically. Uh, one of the most significant things that's happened in terms of this organization, for instance, <clears throat> is that in New York, where up to this time we had about 18 P and about 20 participating associates, that this year they named 16 participating associates on top of the 18, which is the most ironic thing, especially for New York, because they're probably the most conservative of any of the offices. And out of the 16, uh, 15 were below the age of 30. I think that there's a breath of fresh air, and I say that because I was lucky enough to become a partner at, at 33 years old, but also for being with the firm only seven years. And, and that, that creates some problems and maybe easy to understand, but it also is a tremendous boost to people that are working for you or with you on a job to know that, that, that at least there's some awareness of where the, the firm has got to go. Now, um, I'd like to go through a little bit about what are the, what are the, the things externally. What we really talked about are the internal considerations for SMM. I'd like to go into what the external considerations are. What are the, one of them always is, you know, the firm always has to know where is it going to go. It seems like everybody really wants to know that. And I think that uh, we've spent a lot of time, I have, in terms of what is the firm. If you look at the at, at architecture, and now I'm talking just about SOM, not any architecture firm, but it's different for each, for each one, is that within the, the, uh, the building, you might say, there are several industries. And let's say this one is building industry. And this one might be the transportation industry, this may be uh, uh, another type of industry. And I think that in SOM, uh, it's taken a long time to go through this, uh, but I think one of the things is that where is SOM? And I think that everybody, and I think most partners, of course everybody, every partner has a different opinion. But I think in this area, and most of them would agree now, is that SOM is not in the building industry and should not be. It's probably the worst place for it to be, is that if, if SOM is to go and go with these staff services, go with some other things we want to do. It's got to consider itself as a service industry. And being in the service industry, it services the building industry, but it also services the transportation industry. <clears throat> by doing the highway job in, in Baltimore, by doing the highway job in Boston, by doing the highway job in Portland. It also can, can service in the graphics. We're doing a tremendous amount of graphics work right now. We need good graphics people. And that's a separate issue, but that's extremely hard to find. I think in landscaping, it wasn't for a long time until we finally moved into the area. But there's, there's, a, there's a need now to broaden the service industry, and this is one of the real reasons why SOM went to the 37 and a half hour work week, because in the service industry in the United States, that's what they are working today. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a five day or a four day week, it means that uh, base pay should be 37 and a half in recognition that it is a service industry, it is not in the building industry. Also, in, in, in the leadership style of the partners, uh, as you may uh, realize, is that, you know, it wasn't too long ago, maybe four years ago, that the, most of the partners thought that we ought to integrate vertically. 
by going into our own construction firm, by going into construction management, by going into land development. Now, for our SOM only, uh, you can't make the same thing for every artist firm. SOM only, that would have been a disaster. And it would have been a disaster because SOM has operated for a long period of time, as I pictured it, in the service industry, but at the high end of the service industry. Um, and I think for to get into construction is not in tune with the partner's own leadership style. I, I can't imagine a guy like Walter Nitsch uh, handling a construction site. It, it, and, and, and that he would even consider himself with it would be another. Would, it's obvious it wouldn't happen. I think with most partners, um, some are very interested in construction, others aren't. Uh, in land development, I, you know, Walter doesn't have any stock to his name. All he does is buy paintings. But for him to consider land development uh, is almost just, it's, uh, it's out of his realm of thinking. And, I, and, and so you have to take this into consideration. Uh, and, and so that's why the firm could not move, and it would be silly to move it vertically into the building industry. So I think now there's a general agreement of moving horizontally and moving into the service industry. The other real reason for the service industry, of course, and, is that that's where the profits are going to be in the next 20 years. They're not going to be in the building industry. The 10 and 10 doesn't pay enough. Uh, I think that uh, being in the service industry means that we have to be of more service and mean more locations, but that doesn't mean we have to be bigger. It means we just need better people. Uh, I think that by going into the service industry, we may branch out into other, other related fields. But the keystone has to be design. And the design is what you're hired for, and you're hired to do the design in a, in a very economical way. It, it's, it's, in my mind, uh, unbelievable why uh, architects spend so much time trying to get their projects published in architectural magazines, of trying to be accepted by the architectural community. I have yet to know of an architect who has hired another architect, even though it would probably be better if we did. Uh, as Skidmore Sr. said, and he's talked about this, is that, and he said this, I guess, when he got his uh, gold medal at AIA, that he, he was happy in his life that he never had to entertain another architect. I think that if for an architect to entertain another architect is wasting time. Uh, the, the, the amount of work and the amount of involvement an architect can do is, is outside. Your recognition will come from the work you do outside, not from the work that you do inside and trying to get uh, published. I think that that's really the wrong way, and it's not, a, it's not the way that you ought to be marketing your services if you're marketing them. Like anything else, you do have something to sell, and you've got to sell it. And, and, uh, and, and you know, so the whole approach in the service industry of going to these offices overseas, of, of trying to expand our services, is one of expanding the professional services of architecture, basically design and offering something in design that it can be produced quickly, efficiently, and still good. Uh, to kind of wrap this up, i like to draw a little thing very quickly of how maybe all this ties together into kind of a thought process. Uh, I don't know what else you'd call it, but it's something we do spend some time on. Uh, Here's the external world, and here's the internal world. Some of the things come down here of what we call as objectives. And this is, it is really, where, where are we going? What do we really want to accomplish? And from that, you have your strategies. And this is, how are we going to get there? And from these two, you come down to the organization that you're trying to build. You know, that's part of the thought process we've gone through in terms of the, if the, Stein, the staff line relationship. The idea of we know, generally speaking, what everybody really wants to do. It's not something you don't sit down in a partner's meeting and say, well, where do you think we're going? Because you don't get anywhere that way. It's something you sense. and something that, that at some time or other you're, you're forced or you're driven to write something. And when you write a report, another partner will attack it because that's obvious. And from that dialogue, and the dialogue then goes to three people or five people, you tend to, and then to have a bigger, broader base of more decision-making. And from that, you go into these strategies and how are you going to accomplish it. Uh, SOM does not vote partners. You don't go up and say, well, there's so many votes for this. It's, it's done in a colleague-type relationship. Uh, people talk and disagree, probably disagree more than they talk. And it's within that environment in which change does occur. I think that every partner believes that you must have conflict in order for change to occur. 
and in light churn is that when a, 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 if, if a man is hired by the firm, uh, he, uh, he must know where he's going. Uh, there are a lot of people that leave the firm uh, and, and we're very reluctant, but part of that problem is the firm's problem, not being able to give them enough direction. But in light turn, the person who joins the firm has to have the direction. Uh, in one sense, if you don't, you know, I'm using a, a professor of mine at business school who said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. I don't know of any partner or any associate of the firm that does not have a strong belief in where he wants to go. And when you join the firm, unless you have that and do it, uh, then, then all, all is kind of totally lost. The firm is, is a very loose-knit group of people who, who look at this in a very, uh, at times, esoteric way, but also one way of saying, if a person wants to do it, then he ought to be given the opportunity to do it. And if he fails, then he fails. And, and that's, that's really kind of the key issue. Now, part of this, when you come down, you come back to internal is your evaluation, and this is part of the evaluation of the personnel and the other side is monitoring the external market in terms of, of your market conditions, and also what, what's going on today. How, how does the market relate to the, what you're doing? A lot of people dislike some of the architecture we're doing in various cities. I would say most partners do too, but the question about it is that it's still producing good architecture. Um, great architecture only comes with the people and with the experience and with the age, and, the, and we have some tremendous people, I believe, now that that will mature, just like the organization from 36 to 72 has been a maturation process, what we're going through now is a maturation process, and hopefully we'll see a resurgence of, of, uh, of maybe a new style of, of organization, but also a new style of presenting architecture. Are there any other questions? <coughs> or any questions? I'm about a horse. There are, would anybody be interested in uh, hearing about any other area, you know, in terms of management. I don't know what more there would be. This is kind of a large group to have questions. Yes? I, 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 the competition is, a, is kind of a key thing. Um, there's no set number of partners. There's no set number of participants or associates. I think that partners compete among themselves, uh, and I think you, it'd be wrong not to say that. Uh, you know, one partner does something he'd like to, but it, it's it, because he wants to do better. I don't see any partner. I, I would say if you go back into the partnership articles a few years ago, it was almost a corporate style of architecture. If we were going to become a corporation, it probably would have happened then. It'll never happen now. And I think that, that there is a certain amount of competition, not to be better than them, but just to do better every single time. Uh, and, and, and the competition among the staff, there is competition. And I think that, but it's, we would hope, and we hope by going through this kind of process, that the, the rewards of competition and everything else will not be politically motivated. That a guy, if he's good, will show, and if a guy isn't good, will show also. But who you know within the firm should not have any relevance. And it hasn't so far, you know, that we've been able to find out. Yes? Well, every, every project, even within the same studio, or, or if you go to the old project system, every project was budgeted by the people doing the job. And, and if it's budgeted to lose money, then it's budgeted to lose money. And then just so long as they don't lose any more than that. Um, I think that the whole thing, it's pretty much systematized. I was going to spend some time tomorrow going through it. Uh, but they have the regular reports they get biweekly. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, there's been too much emphasis on budgets and too much emphasis on uh, all that. I'm, I'm growing very tired of them because if a job is in trouble, there's not much you can do. And uh, it's only good to know that when you get that next fee, that you use that as the basic fee information. But I think there's so many reasons why a job goes bad that it's much more important, as we found, if a job loses money, then usually the design isn't any good either. And usually the client's unhappy. And so it all kind of falls together. So there's other ways of determining whether a job loses money or doesn't lose money. And I, and I think that, that, that there's been too much emphasis in the last three or four years on budgeting. 
uh, but yet I've seen architects that have no budgets, don't even know where they're going, and I think that's equally as wrong. There's a midpoint to hit between them. And, but it still has to be loose. You still have to take into account the leadership style of the guy who is running the job. A guy like Walter Nitsch doesn't need any reports. Walter is there every single day. He's with his people. He knows as much about those jobs as, you know, as anybody. And, and so, you know, he doesn't need that many. You know, I don't think he needs any. He operates with none. What do you mean? We have three. We have the, the, the staff group or the employee group, the PA group, the uh, uh, associate partners and general partners. No, no, no. It's no one like that. No. Gee, um, you have to, there's a funny thing in SOM that those partnership groups are really separate from how we're organized. You know, you may have, if I could use the old word, the, the senior designer and a job captain. They're really together like this. And these people, you might have your senior designer as an associate partner, your job captain may be the participating associate. Uh, but the, the, and the guy working for him may be an associate partner. The partnership ranking is separate from the ranking of classification within the office. A studio head, for instance, right now, we've made a studio head. Uh, we have general partners, we have associate partners, we have participating associates. Uh, we have one studio head that's been with the firm, I think, probably the, one of the most talented men that I've seen. Uh, he's just graduated. He's been there a year now, a year and two months. We made him a participating associate. He has his own studio. He's handling a job in, uh, in Brussels for us. I think is one of the most remarkable men I've met in my life. And he's 24, 25, 24 years old. But he has associate partners working for him. So, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an organization where that's layered. Now, you won't find an associate partner working for a general partner, though. I mean, general partner, you know, that, that below them are the associate partners and the participating associates. But two general partners usually work together on a, on a job. Uh, it, but in some cases, we've had some cases where general partners have helped out an associate partner, like even this guy handling this job as a PA, would help him out. It, it's, a very, it's, a, it's not a strong structure. It's a, it's a strong structure by itself in terms of the partnership group. As I said, is that now it's one, one uh, guy in the partnership group for every 3.2 of the staff. Uh, you go back with 6. Point, but, you know, as we're moving, we're having more people within the partnership group. But that doesn't determine, uh, you know, a field man uh, who has a tremendous amount of say in the construction site uh, may not even be a participant. And yet he may be working right with a senior designer who is an architect or a senior studio architect who is an associate partner. And, and his word would be heard. So it, it, there's no channels. I, I guess the only channel we've tried to set up now is a studio is that the studio man is responsible for people within his studio and for hiring them. Uh, it used to be that we had one guy just like I got turned down twice. And that irritated me a great deal, as you may expect. But I think that uh, since then, each studio head can hire uh, people for his own studio. You know, all they do is coordinate it with a, with a staff group and personnel with salaries, wages, benefits. But they, in turn, can go out and search and find people and bring them in. So instead of having one person hire, we now have 15. So it's much more decentralized, except the staff functions of personnel, accounting, the rest are much more centralized. You know, it, it's in one sense we're, we're, we're spreading the risk, you might say, but on the other side, we're pulling everything together. So we still have control over basic policy decisions, basic personnel decisions, things like this. But the ability for a man to attract a person to the firm now it's with the studio head. And he'll work directly with him, you know, and there's most is 24 to 25 people in the group. Yes? Power? No? Never talk about it. A partner, a power. 
Well, I'll tell you, there's no such thing as raw power within the partnership. There's no partner that can stand up, let's say, and I have some influence, but I would never tell another partner what to do, and I would hope a partner would never tell me what to do. But the partners have said, you know, it's my responsibility to take over the financial management, the internal administration, and kind of the forward thrust of the firm to organize it. But the decisions, decisions are made in a very, uh, in a slow way, but also in a, in a very um, open kind of atmosphere. It's not the power of a job, you know, of jobs going along. That's easy to talk about. Jobs going along, the senior designer doesn't like it. He's got the power to cut it right then and there. On a job-by-job -job basis, the power is very clear cut. Um, and and it's, it's the senior designer, the senior studio head, who has the ultimate authority and responsibility for that job. When you're talking about the internal administration or administration of two or three studios, and you have those two or three guys together, that's what I call the subtle art of management. There's no one, I mean, there's certain people, you know, someone talked to me, said the other day, he said, well, you know, Gordon, Bunchak, and Bun said, well, you know, you and I are partners, but I'm just a little bit more equal than you are. Well, you know, Bun's a hell of an architect, and if he said something, I surely would say, yeah. You know, I, there, there's a certain amount of respect you hold for some of the, uh, some of the partners, or all of them, all of them. You know, there's one of mutual respect. Uh, you know, for a guy like Nat Owings, and Nat is, is sensational at, at great philosophy, you know, philosophical comments and things that I'm talking about now. But if you asked him to work on the checkbook, you asked him some comments about job cost or what hours did he charge to a job, uh, I mean, that's not going to happen. Uh, and so, you know, each guy has his own strengths. But there isn't, there is not within the firm one sensual partner who has the right to say yes or no. I've never seen that occur, and, and, and I've been sitting in the partnership meetings for five years. But there are partners, when issues come up, it's surprisingly how close the partners will think. There also is no general design board. People say, well, you have, you know, these studios. Who reviews all the designs? I have often wondered that myself, and uh, no one does. I mean, uh, that studio head and that guy who's doing it, and this, this young participant, it's, it's on his back. And, uh, uh, you know, that's where it lies. Now, if it really gets serious, a general partner would step in and do something. But generally speaking, the, the, there's no such thing as raw root power. There can't be. I mean, I, I don't know how the firm with the leadership style exhibited by the current partners would, would permit that to happen. Because every partner, people have often said, well, why aren't you a corporation? You can't decide on the president. No, that's not really the case. I think they would decide on the president, and I think I know who it would probably be. But I think that they, that they wouldn't listen to him. I think that the partner, uh, a, a partner uh, in an architectural practice, and, and the guys were all architects now, well, engineers in Fos Khan. But generally speaking, they're practitioners, and they want to be uh, uh, in a partnership. You know, it's their business. You know, I own part of the firm as much as they do, and it's one of being uh, self-employed. In a corporation, you wouldn't have that. And there's a deep sense of feeling of, of, uh, and people are talking about this competition, but there's a lot of competition about what, what can we do more, you know, better. And as you're seeing the older partners getting older, they're much more interested in the younger people, much more interested in, you know, one of their, you know, after you do so many buildings and, you, you know, some guys turn around, you know, they have to start looking towards the future. But one of their greatest goals is, is to bring up young people and to train them and to train them and, and teach them what they have in terms of the exchange theory and human relations uh, to, to, to uh, take over for them. That's a tremendous rewarding experience. And as so doing, of course, you would have respect for those people. And, and when you have major decisions and major confrontations within an office, the partners have got to sit down. And generally speaking, there will be uh, some kind of agreement. But it, it does not act as if you had a problem this afternoon and you needed a decision and it was not a project to say it was something else entirely with the firm. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think if it was internal matters or financial matters, I'd make the decision, but I'd sure tell the other partners. Uh, but there isn't. There is really no reason or no need to have this big uh, stick because everybody kind of polices themselves. Every partner can sign the firm away tomorrow. Every, every partner has the right to do that. Every partner can do anything he wants. We just ask that he at least talk to another partner. But that's, 
but that there's a lot of freedom in that regards, and that's one of the key aspects of being a partnership other than a uh, corporation. But we, we do talk about it. You know, I thought a lot about that when I wrote up some of this stuff. I, I don't see it ever happening. Not yet. Not until maybe the old partners leave and the new partners are coming in now. But there's a very strong ph philosophical approach towards having a man have uh, the, the, uh, as much opportunity to, to either swing or get out at a very early age. But if he does make a mistake, there are partners. You know, I think everybody jumps on him. I mean, it just isn't one guy then. So the competition and pressure is very great. Yes. Yes, yes, we're a partner. No, no, we take it on ourselves. That's why it's not always advantageous to be a partner. Right, there are no shields in SOM. It, you know, if there was ever a lawsuit that we lost, uh, it would come out of my pocket as much as Nats or Gordon's and the rest. Um, and that's a major, you know, but I don't know how you can protect yourself against that any other way. Uh, corporation would not do it entirely. So uh, we, uh, you know, that's just one of the obligations. Also, it makes you, you know, you push. The, you know, we have a partner, Dick Lenke, who, and, and who is responsible for the technical. Like I handle the administrative, he's responsible for the technical. And um, yeah, he's, he, you know, when there's that much emphasis being placed on it, you're making sure that everything is hopefully done correctly. But you never know. Any more questions? I see that it's 9 o'clock, and I'm supposed to. Thank you.